we call familial hypercholesterolemia, where your cholesterol sits between 7 to 10 no matter what you do. And these people had a much higher rate of vascular disease. And so that's where things become foolish because then people said, oh, well, the, these people got very high cholesterols and a very high risk for heart disease. Therefore, cholesterol causes heart disease. Welcome to the Eat, Live and Move podcast by Miyagi, a space where we bring you the latest science-backed conversations, expert insights and practical tips relating to all things health and wellness. Hello, I'm Dr. Gina Cleo, your personal habit change expert. And I'm Dr. Ross Walker, a cardiologist and preventative health expert. Together with our 60 plus years of collective experience, we're on a mission to help you to improve your health and transform your habits so you can eat, live and move better one episode at a time without the fluff or the fads. Today's episode is quite an exciting one as we're going to be talking about something that is quite misunderstood by a lot of people and that is cholesterol. And of course, I'm joined by a cardiologist. So this is going to be so insightful. We recently posted a reel on our social media where Dr. Ross debunked some really common myths around cholesterol. And we got a huge response from this. And so many people were asking questions and wanting to have more information on the topic. So here we are. We are going to give you some of that information on today's episode. There's a lot that we're going to talk about. Well, mostly Dr. Ross is going to do most of the talking and he's because he's the expert in the field. So we're going to cover firstly, what is cholesterol and why do we need cholesterol for our health? And then we're going to debunk the top five myths about cholesterol and reveal the truth about how you can effectively manage your cholesterol and reduce your risk of heart disease. If you enjoy this episode, please make sure you subscribe so that you are always the first to know when we drop a new episode. Now, let's dive in. So Ross, before we dive into the juicy myths around cholesterol, can you please explain what are the basics of cholesterol and why do we actually need cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is a waxy, fatty-like substance that's essential for life. And people have to realize that. If you had no cholesterol in your body, if someone took all the cholesterol out of your body, you wouldn't survive 24 hours. That's the first point. So why is it important? Well, basically, cholesterol is so important in cell metabolism. It's a very important component of cell membranes. It's the basic ring for steroid metabolism and steroid hormones are vital to, to a healthy life, vitamin D metabolism, bile salt, salt metabolism. So cholesterol itself is very, very important for a good quality life. Why would we, you're saying we wouldn't survive within like 24 hours. Why? Why is it like, I don't understand exactly what it's doing in our body. Well, you, you'd have nothing to protect your cell membranes. Your, your, you'd have none of these steroid hormones. So, so for example, if I took both your adrenal glands out, the adrenal glands make make a whole lot of cortisone-based hormones and a whole lot of adrenaline-based hormones, you'd be dead within 24 hours because you're not making cortisone, which is vital for life in physiologic doses. Adrenaline is vital for life in physiologic doses, not in pathologic doses. So we're not talking about diseases of, of having too much steroid in the body or we're not talking about being given oral prednisone. We're just talking about in physiologic doses and cholesterol is vital for all of these things. There's almost every reaction in the body has a, a cholesterol-related effect. So it's not all cholesterol, but I'm saying it is a vital chemical for normal life. Sounds like we've demonized cholesterol then. We certainly, cholesterol is certainly associated with a negative connotation, but you're telling us, well, that's not necessarily the case. Of course it's not. Uh, not, not the slightest. And I, I think an important point here is that in terms of cardiovascular disease, which obviously keeps me in a job, there are two what I call substrate risk factors, and they are cholesterol and blood pressure, okay? So if your total cholesterol lifelong is below three millimoles per litre and your systolic blood pressure lifelong is below 100 millimetres of mercury, then you do not get atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So atherosclerosis is the progressive buildup of fat. So imagine a donut with a hole in the middle. Fat builds up in the wall like this. That process is called atherosclerosis, fat, inflammatory tissue, calcification. And that occurs once your total cholesterol gets above three, 
and once your systolic blood pressure gets above 100. But no one living in the modern world has total cholesterols below 3 or below 100 unless they're on a bucket of drugs to do so. So, so cholesterol is still vital up to that level for normal physiology, as is blood pressure. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Now, you said like a, f- a few numbers and letters, which I have no idea about, but I'm assuming that that's something like a blood test. A blood test and a blood pressure check. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. I think one of the reasons, and this, I guess it comes back to one of the first myth that I want to talk about. One of the reasons that cholesterol is demonized is that, the I guess this myth is that total cholesterol is a key indicator of heart disease. So we essentially think when we go to the doctor and we get a blood test and we have a high total cholesterol, that's going to be indicating that we're going to get unwell with heart disease. But are you like what? what's that about? Well, look, many, many years ago, a thing started called the Framingham Heart Study. Now, Framingham is a a little city outside of Boston, and what some genius actually did, I'm not demeaning this person, I'm saying they are a genius, they said, why don't we look at the entire population's health and see what factors are going on in their health that are determining different diseases? And they especially focused on cardiovascular disease. And they found out very early on there was a small group of people had enormously high cholesterol, the thing we call familial hypercholesterolemia, where your cholesterol sits between 7 to 10 no matter what you do. And these people had a much higher rate of vascular disease. And so that's where things become foolish because then people said, oh, well, the, these people got very high cholesterols and a very high risk for heart disease, therefore cholesterol causes heart disease. And it was complete nonsense because then as Framingham went on, they looked at the cholesterol levels of people who had heart disease and then looked at the cholesterol levels of people who didn't have heart disease, they're exactly the same. So there was no no link. That's blowing my mind because for such a long time, that's what we've been told and that's what we've believed. And, 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 I mean, that's what some doctors have also said. That's what's in even some textbooks. So is that really where the myth originated and it's just continued like that? Yeah. So interestingly, it it came from a guy years and years ago, I think it was in the 60s, a fellow called Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys started a thing called the, that he published a, a paper called the Seven Countries Trial, where he looked at 22 countries and released the results of six in a thing he called the Seven Countries Trial, because obviously the other countries didn't fit, up, fit his argument, which was cholesterol and fat caused heart disease. And at the same time, a guy called John Yudkin in, in England come and said, it's not cholesterol and fat, it is processed sugars that are causing heart disease. And he was shut down by the very powerful sugar industry. So everyone believed Ansel Keys' nonsense. And they've kept believing this nonsense without actually looking at the science. And in fact, they found that things like the average cholesterol level of people living in society is around 6 millimoles per litre, people with heart disease about 6 millimoles per litre, people without heart disease about 6 millimoles per litre. So it's it's not as simple as saying, oh, my cholesterol's high, therefore it's spilling into my arteries. As a cardiologist, I've seen people with very high cholesterol have nothing in their arteries, very high cholesterol have arteries full of muck. I've seen people with pretty normal cholesterol have nothing in their arteries, people with pretty normal cholesterol have arteries full of muck. It's just There's just no link. And why people keep carrying on with this nonsense is just beyond yeah, me. That is wild. Okay, so say, take me, I'm in my late 30s, both my parents have have high cholesterol, I believe. I certainly know that my grandparents had high cholesterol. So I'd say that especially my mum has familial high cholesterol. Say I come to you and my total cholesterol is a bit high. What does that mean? Would you do any other testing or you're not bothered by that? Uh, look, if you said to me, my father had a bypass at 45, then I'd get more interested. But, but... If you someone like you, Gina, who doesn't doesn't have much in the way of what we call body fat, um, your total cholesterol your cholesterol might be seven. Your HDL two point five, which is a very high HDL. Your triglycerides could be 0.7, just as a below one, and that and you you what what we call a lean hyper responder, and it's a very healthy cholesterol pattern. But there are some very foolish, ignorant doctors who are starting people on statin drugs. In, entirely in that situation. 
And I'll, t- I'll tell you a, a, a story. Now, this is an anecdote, not a clinical trial, but it's a very powerful anecdote. I had a 38-year-old man come to see me who some fool had put on a statin 10 years before at the age of 28 because his uncle had a heart attack at 55 and his cholesterol was high. So he was on 40 milligrams of what we call a torvastatin, which is a fat-soluble statin that I don't prescribe at all. I'll tell you why when we get to the rest of the myths. But he went on to tell me that his wife had been through 10 unsuccessful cycles of IVF until it twigged in his head that possibly it was the statin he was taking that was affecting his fertility and therefore his wife's ability to conceive. He goes off the statin and within six months, she got pregnant naturally. Now, I would put to you, Gina, that is medical negligence to put a person on a cholesterol-lowering pill purely because their cholesterol is high, no, not even assessing what their risk is for heart disease. Because a 38-year-old man with that sort of family history and nothing else, no other risk factors for heart disease, his 10-year risk for a heart attack is probably 1%. So if you give him a statin, you take his risk from 1%, to 0.8%. That's a 20% reduction. I mean, seriously, that's outrageous. It is outrageous. We we, we have to start looking, we have to start rethinking how we look at total cholesterol because there is no link between total cholesterol and heart disease. My Myth gosh, number one. This is like I, I feel like we need billboards all around the world with this on it because this is such a common myth. I mean, I mean, I'm a dietitian and I'm pretty sure that we were taught that there's a very strong link between high cholesterol and heart disease. And and I'm saying, you know, I was trained as a, di- a long, long time ago. I'm not saying that that's what all dietitians say or anything like that. But yeah, that's blowing my mind. And you know, as a quick side note, as someone who's done two rounds of IVF egg freezing, I feel for that woman because those are, it was probably one of the most challenging times, easily actually, the most challenging time of my life. Those hormones are full on. And to go through 10 rounds of it when it was all done in vain would have been heartbreaking. Yeah. $100,000 $100, and the extraordinary yeah. emotional misery oh. of failed IVF. And also, another point, a lot of people don't realize this, failed IVF is associated with double the risk of heart disease over the next 10 years. Really? For the yep. woman or the man? For the woman. Wow. Is that because of heartbreak or because of the hormones? No, no, no it could be pa- partially that, but I think it's mm. more all the hormones your body's flogged with yeah. and when, when things it's don't helpful. take. So I think there's a lot of stuff going with it. Yeah. No one oh. really knows. Well, that was a huge myth. I don't even know how we're going to top that one off. But here's myth number two. The common myth is that LDL cholesterol is bad and HDL is good, which is too simplistic. So can you tell us what is LDL, what's HDL, what do they mean? Okay. So let me say that simplistically, and it's a bit more detailed than this, but I think it works for uh, practically and for the clinical argument. LDL and HDL are divided into small bits and large bits, and here's where size is important. The larger your LDL, the larger your HDL, the healthier the pattern is. It is small LDL, small dense LDL, that can easily cross across the the arterial wall and set up a fatty plaque. So it's the small bit of LDL that's bad. It is small HDL that is pro-inflammatory, so it heightens the inflammatory response to that fatty plaque that's building up. So They're the bad things, but large LDL, large HDL is good for you. So how do you know that your LDL is large, your HDL is large? Pretty simple. In almost all cases, what we've already mentioned, you have a high total cholesterol, but a much higher HDL and low triglyceride, which is another fatty component, on your blood test. That's the simple way of doing it. And interestingly, 70% of heart disease is related to the insulin resistance gene which is tendency to diabetes, blood pressure, and here's where we're talking about cholesterol. High triglyceride, low HDL is an indicator of small LDL. And then again, with that, abdominal obesity, et cetera. So that's that's the the small LDL versus large LDL. So just to to summarize, then I'll, I'll answer it. But small LDL puts fat in the arteries. Large LDL is what is, is very good for you. Healthy cell membrane, cell metabolism, bile salt, vitamin D and steroid metabolism, large HDL sucks fat out of the arteries, small HDL pro-inflammatory. And when we do a blood test and it just has HDL and LDL on it, is that small or big or is it a total of both? No, that's just a total of both. So you can't really tell. 
but you can say, okay, that cholesterol's up, but there's a lot of HDL. So look at the cholesterol HDL ratio. I like it less than 3.5 and see that the triglycerides are below one. And a lot of people do a, a triglyceride to HDL ratio. I want to make sure that's less than one, for example. It feels like the blood test, I know for myself anyway, I have misinterpreted them for a really long time because I think I've definitely taken that simplistic view of high LDL is bad and low HDL is bad. And my, if my HDL has ever been low in a blood test, I'm like, right, I need to eat more avocado and salmon and nuts. And, and if my LDL has been high, then I've been conscious of, of, you know, of reducing some foods in my diet, which probably isn't a bad thing, but are we... We're obviously really simplifying these blood tests, yeah. aren't we? And, and let me say, you can measure directly the particle size. That that can be done. It's not covered by Medicare or any, any of the other. So it might cost you $250 extra if you want to know. And to be frank with you, I don't measure that that often unless I'm looking for a reason why someone has unusual buildup of fat in their artery. So just say, for example, I've got a 35-year-old patient who's already had three stents in his arteries up to age 35. All of his blood tests are normal. His lipoprotein, little A, is normal, which we'll get onto a bit later on. But he has a lot of small, dense LDL. So that's what I'm targeting. Mm. Yeah, so interesting. So interesting. Um, one, more, one more final comment. You can also measure, if you want to, what's called apolipoprotein B, which carries LDL cholesterol, and apolipoprotein capital A1, which carries HDL cholesterol. That may give you a little bit more ev- uh, information, but it's not vitally necessary. You sound like a cardiologist. It's because I am. <laughs> All right. Myth number three. And I guess this ties in to myth number two a little bit, but the myth is that everybody who has high LDL, which we're you know looking at as bad cholesterol, needs to be on a statin. Yeah, and in my view... Statins are one of the most miracle drugs in cardiology and also they're one of the most overprescribed drugs in cardiology. So what, what's happened up to now is, is that many doctors who spend a lot of time looking after very sick people in hospitals then extrapolate that information to the guy in the street who's come into their offices rather than being in a hospital. So the information up the top, of, so there's normal, there's your heart disease, the information up the top of the hill, so people who are very, very high risk for heart disease, doesn't pertain to people who are at low risk. So I, I gave you the example before about the 38-year-old man. So a standard person, male age 50, standard female age 60, who doesn't have high risk factors for heart disease, the five major risk factors, even though we're talking this the myth today, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, diabetic risk and family history, they're the standard proposed risk factors. I'm not saying they are, but they're the standard proposed risk factors by the medical profession. So if you don't have one of those five, I think all males at age 50, all females at age 60 should, and because women are protected by their hormones until menopause against cardiovascular disease, should have a coronary calcium score. Now that's a CT scan that takes a snapshot of your arteries and measures directly how much muck you have in the arteries. The calcium itself doesn't matter a hang but it's a marker for how much fat you have. So the higher your coronary calcium, the higher your coronary fat. Now, there's another test which is done on the same technology called a CT angiogram, where they squirt you full of dye. And a big study that was published a few years ago looked at the the predictive comparison of a coronary calcium score versus a CT angiogram. And the coronary calcium score is actually a better predictor. But most of my colleagues now are just going straight for the CT angiogram because they say, oh, very occasionally you'll miss someone who's got a 90% block and a zero calcium score. Yeah, one in 500 people. But does that mean you should justify the extra, it's not covered by Medicare, so the extra $800 to $1,000 it's going to cost you, The you glow in the dark for three days afterwards because of the radiation dose, you give an intravenous injection that you could have an anaphylactic reaction to or it can damage your kidneys and the potential need for beta blockers as well. I'm not against the test. But there is, there is no, I use the test for people who've got symptoms and equivocal stress testing, but there are, there's no evidence that in asymptomatic people, the CT angiogram is better than the calcium score. Now, here's the drop. 
been many studies, but the best study was done by Professor Valines from Philadelphia, published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology in 2018, where he looked at 13,500 people over 10 years, between the ages of about 50 up to about 70, 75, and found that if your coronary calcium score is zero, regardless of your cholesterol level, there is zero benefit being on a statin. If your coronary calcium score is below 100, there is no statistically significant benefit being on a statin. So there's a thing called NNT, which is number needed to treat. And it shows if your calcium score is, say, between 10 to 100, so up to 10 is the same as zero in terms of prognosis. So it's 10 to 100. You have to treat 100 people for five years to prevent one event and no difference in death rate. So why on earth would you put someone on a very strong synthetic me uh, metabolic regulator like a statin for 10 years for such a minimal benefit. But once you get over a calcium score of 100 or you've already had a heart attack stent or a bypass, the number needed to treat there's only 12. So there is a significant benefit. So that's how I do it. So zero is what you want, the power of zero. Up to 10, I consider the same as zero. 10 to 100 is mild risk, low, low level risk. 100 to 400 is moderate risk. And above 400 is don't read Tolstoy or buy green bananas. <laughs> so, and but but that's when you need very heavy aggressive risk factor modification. Yeah. Okay. And that's really when you need to be seeing a specialist. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So basically, I don't just look at cholesterol. I look at someone's total risk, and all the studies show beyond a doubt that the coronary calcium score is the best predictor of risk. But I also look at other things as well. I do look at the whole cholesterol profile. I look at their blood pressure. I look at their smoking history. I look at their metabolic risk. So are they pre-diabetic, diabetic? What weight are they carrying? And also, I look at their family history as well. So, and this is the interesting thing, and we'll get onto this in the final myth, but, but I've got families where there might be four siblings, two have vicious disease and two don't, and I'll explain that in the final myth. Mm. That would be savage. All right. Well, I want to get to the final myth. So I'm going to go with myth number four so we can get to the final one. Myth number four is that there is nothing you can do to reduce calcified plaque in your arteries once they're already there. Yeah. Well, the first point here is it's not the calcium that's the problem anyhow. I have so many people say to me, oh, doctor, my calcium score is 150. What can I do to get rid of the calcium? That's not the problem. The calcium is a marker for fat. So again, imagine the donut with a hole in the middle. The fat's building up in the wall, not causing a blockage, building up in the wall like this. If you don't treat it, one day if Rich is a critical mass, you're under stress, it goes, <clears throat> that's a heart attack. When you crack open a plaque, a clot forms, you block the artery. But as the fat builds up in the wall, the body throws in calcium to act as a scaffold to stop it from breaking down. So the calcium's a reparative response to fat. So what you want to do is shrink the fat down, not get rid of the calcium. You can take a bit of the calcium out of the arteries. That's fine. You don't want to get the arteries to get too hard. That's why I talk about vitamin K2. I'll get to that in a second. But what you want to do is shrink the fat down. And with the right approach, you can do that in almost everybody. So when people say, oh, once I'm, I've got the stuff, I'm stuck with it. Of course, you're not, you're not going to go from having severe blocks in your arteries to nothing, but you can stabilize your arteries, reduce the fat content, by this approach. So what is the approach? This is the exciting thing. This is what I call my 80-10-10 rule. And this is what really disturbs me, Gina, and it would disturb you as a habit expert as well. I have the people come in with the, the big tummies or the fag hang out of their mouth and they go, doctor, give me more of that Lipitor for my cholesterol. And, that's by, and, and, and a lot of people take these cholesterol-lowering pills, these statin drugs, and think they can eat what they like because they're on a statin which is biologic nonsense. And I say all the time, people have two or three pieces of fruit every day, three to five servings of vegetables every day, have the lowest rates of heart disease and cancer in the community, and it doesn't do zip to your cholesterol. But what it does is keep your immune system under control so you don't get activated chronic inflammation. So 80%, what's, what, what is the 80 part of the 80-10-10 rule? Obviously, the five keys of being healthy, which we've spoken about before, but it's having no addictions, good quality sleep, good quality eating, and less of it, three to five hours of exercise, we've spoken about that one as well, and most importantly, happiness. That is 80% of everyone's management, and many people 
struggle to achieve that. Less than 10% of people in society do that well. The other 10% is the appropriate use of medical therapy, which will include statin drugs if your calcium score is too high or you've already had a cardiac event. And, and I sort of personally the other day had bypass and said, oh, but I don't want those statins, doctor. And I said, I said, why? He said, oh, because I'm worried about the side effects. Have you ever had them? Yeah. Did you have side effects? No. I said, well, what are you worried about? I said, the statins are going to give you an extra benefit, maybe only 10%, but they're still going to give you a benefit. And you treat blood pressure and you treat diabetic risk. So you do all of that with the pharmaceutical side of it. And then the other 10% is the use of evidence-based supplements. So I mentioned before vitamin K2 that takes the calcium out of the arteries, puts it back in your bones. So you get two bangs for your buck with K2. But I also use the bergamot products, which have a profound effect on metabolism. Now, here's what bergamot does. Shifts you from small LDL to large LDL, small HDL to large HDL. We have published data that I was, I was involved in the paper, the Journal of Clinical Lipidology, showing that was the case with the bergamot products. Ubiquinol and, and magnesium orotate stop the statins from depleting coenzyme Q10 in your muscles, so less of the muscle aches and pains that some people get with statins. And kyolic garlic, a mate of mine in Southern California called Professor Matt Budoff is one of the top preventative cardiologists over there, has done a study where he gave people four kyolic garlics a day and actually reversed the fatty plaques in their arteries. So the 80-10-10 rule works for almost everybody, especially if they follow it well, which a lot of people don't do. <laughs> it's harder to, harder to say, wait, harder to, to do than to say. Absolutely. So here is the final myth that I've finally been waiting for, and that is heart disease is all due to lifestyle factors. Yeah, and see, this, this is where everyone gets it wrong. All disease is genetic, but your genes loads the gun then your environment pulls the trigger. So 90% of heart disease is due to two common genes. The commonest gene on the planet is the insulin resistance gene. So 70% of people with heart disease are insulin resistant to some extent, which sets them up for diabetes, blood pressure, high triglyceride, low HDL, fat around the belly, et cetera, et cetera, fatty liver, gout, you name it. That's all part of the insulin resistance gene. 20% is due to lipoprotein little a. Now, lipoprotein to delay, only one way of getting in your bloodstream, it's called picking the wrong relatives, absolutely genetic. And if if one of your family members has that, you've got a 50% chance of getting it. It's an autosomal dominant gene, and it's the cause of one in five cases of heart disease. And doctors have only started to show some interest in it in the last few years because we're developing heavy drugs to lower lipoprotein to delay. But I've been treating lipoprotein to delay, measuring it and treating it for 30 years with specific supplements and an old style drug called nicotinic acid, which is the pharmaceutical version of vitamin B3 with great effect. So that's 90% of heart disease. The other 10% are due to a, a number of other less common for, uh, genetic risk factors, such as the familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a cholesterol between seven to 10, an HDL around one, a triglyceride around one. That's typical familial hypercholesterol. So some people say, oh, look, my cholesterol is 6.5, therefore I've got familial hypercholesterolemia. No, you don't. You've got to have it between those levels and the other parameters on your triglycerides. And, and, and there's other things called APOE. So APOE is something we should devote a, a podcast to because there's the APOE alleles, APOE 2, 3, and 4. And as anyone knows from Genetics 101, you get all genes are paired. You get one from mum and one from dad. So people who've got APOE3-3, that's the common one. APOE3-4 is a higher risk of vascular disease and dementia in your 70s and 80s. APOE4-4 is a higher risk of vascular disease very early on and dementia very early on. And Chris Hemsworth just came out and said he's been tested and he's APOE4-4. So people who have that, and I've got a few patients in my own practice who are 4-4, I've got them on very aggressive programs so that they don't get issues. I interviewed a woman in my radio show a few weeks ago from the Centenary Institute in Sydney who's shown beyond a doubt that Alzheimer's disease, the first change is endothelial dysfunction. The endothelium, of course, being the biggest organ in the body, which is the single layer of blood vessel uh, cells that line every blood vessel in the body. It's about six tennis courts in area. 
And so there are things you can do for all of these things if you know what you're doing and you pick them up early and you treat them early. But people have to realize the reason why you'll hear someone in their 50s who's dropped dead for no good reason, there's always a genetic reason. And I spoke about calcium scoring before. The worst calcium score I have is a 68-year-old man in the fitness industry, doesn't have an ounce of body fat, totally normal cholesterol, blood pressure, never smoked, not diabetic, no family history. But the combination of mum and dad has given him a high lipoprotein delay. Any calcium score above 400 series, his was 8,500. Oh, that's so unfair. And his arteries were like porcelain pipes. That was 10 years ago. He had bypass surgery. He sent me an email a few years ago with a picture of him and his mates winning their latest basketball grand final. So he'll still live till he's 100 on my watch. Um, He'll be fine. That's amazing. He's terrific. So should we be getting these blood tests to check out? Of course. Yeah, so like everybody should be doing this? I think so. I I think the, the time to start having blood tests along these lines are about age 30. And the reason I say age 30 is I don't know too many people in their 20s who are that motivated by health. So a lot of a lot of people in their 20s will go to the gym, will play sport to look good, but they, they're not doing it because of the long-term effects. People get into their 30s and they start to realize there is a thing called mortality and they start thinking about that and thinking, well, it's about time I start to think about my health. So it's a good time to have a full lipid profile, fasting blood sugar level hemoglobin A1C, your life approaching is delay checked. And you only need that checked once to see whether it's high or low. If, if it's high, then I would, if you're at low risk, I'd say to vitamin C, vitamin E, lysine. Um, but if you're at high risk, then I I've, I've use other therapies at the moment. And we've got these newer therapies coming through that just pulverize lipoprotein and delay, but they're just being tested to see whether they then reduce your risk for vascular disease by lowering lipoprotein and delay. I just, I'll finish off with a, a nice story. I've got a 70-year-old man whose father had bypass in his 60s, whose grandfather died in his 60s of heart disease, all three of them high lipoprotein to delay. But this band's been under my care for 30 years and has been taking vitamin C, vitamin E and lysine for 30 years. And he had a calcium score the other day at the age of 70 and it came back a big fat zero. Wow. Wow. That's an anecdote. That is not a clinical trial. That is yeah. an anecdote. It's a But it's still story, a though. powerful anecdote. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Ross, there was one thing that you said earlier that I just want to circle back to because it took this long for my mind to get around, like, the concept of it. I used to work in the cardiac ward in the hospital as a dietitian, and for patients that were on the cardiac diet, they would be given a low-fat diet, and not at all would sugar be considered. But at the start of this episode, you said it has nothing to do with the fat we're eating, but it's the sugar. So can what... I mean, tell me more about this. Okay. Well, let let me just quote the biggest dietary trial in the world, which is a thing called the PURE study. 220,000 people followed for nine years in 50 different countries. It showed in in that particular study, and we're talking not just in Western society, across the board in the 50 countries, those who had the highest intake of saturated fat had a 25% reduction in all-cause death and cardiac disease. So we're, we're told, oh, saturated fat is the big culprit in heart disease. No, it's not. It's nonsense. But the studies show that people had the highest carbohydrate intake of refined carbohydrates. So you know as an expert dietitian, the best carbohydrates on the planet are fruits and vegetables. But people, people had the highest intake of refined carbohydrates, sugar, white bread, pasta, potatoes, rice. These people had a 28% increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So, so I think John Yudkin was right. I think uh, that the uh, the other lunatic, Ansel, sorry, the other gentleman, Ansel Keys, was wrong. Um, and and I think that again, all of the studies are now showing the real pandemic of the twenty first century is diabetes. So it's the fact that since sugar has become much more prominent in our, our diets, people are putting on all the weight, and because they're putting on the weight. That's in bringing out the insulin resistance gene to the clinical manifestation, which we call metabolic syndrome, and that's where all the issues are coming from. 70% of heart disease is explained by one gene, that gene in this society. I really like pasta and rice and potatoes. Yeah, I'm not saying you can't. Did the study 
But did the study differentiate between was it refined pasta compared to whole grain pasta, for yeah. example? I, 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 I gave you a great example there. In Australia, our we, we, we our wheat is very hybridized and has a huge amount of gluten in it. I don't think it's particularly good for you. Whereas durum wheat that they have in Italy, because they have a lot of pasta in Italy, part of the Mediterranean diet, uh, has low gluten content. And it just, for some reason, doesn't seem to have the same uh, effect on insulin resistance. So I think, it, yes, I, I don't think all pasta is created equal. Um, and what about so rice, I, potatoes? I, I feel the yeah. same. You know, I have basmati rice, for example. It's it's low GI or low glycemic no, it, 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 it gets on to weight and caloric intake. So you go to rural China, 80% of their diet is in rice, but yeah. they only take in 1,200 calories a day. Yeah. Whereas you look at the caloric intake of the average person living in Western society, it's somewhere between, and you know this better than me as an expert dietitian, but two and a half to three and a half thousand calories a day, not the 1,200. Okay. So, so I, so I think we're it's- not, We're not it's saying the that it's the- it's Okay, so maybe what we're saying is that refined carbohydrates will obviously don't keep us full for very long, and therefore we're probably eating more and like and they include more processed food, like more sugar, et cetera. Whereas yep. if we're eating whole foods, foods that are yep. less processed, it doesn't matter if it's basmati rice or a white potato, as long as you're still consuming an adequate amount for your body and not over, mm. then yes. we're A-OK. -okay. Yeah, and that's the problem Sweet. is- so we can still have uh, potatoes. That's great. Of, that's of all course, I want us to know. Look, uh, look, I call it man salad. Of, of course, you can have fries occasionally. I'm not saying. Look, I, I, I'm talking about the dose. We're all taking yeah. in more calories than we need. Yeah. And then it's the quality of the calories once you get to a certain level that cause the issue. So yeah. I don't think the, the evidence for saturated fat is very, very weak. Uh, and in fact, part of that pure study, they did one, one sub study showing that if you had on average per day 100 grams of red meat and three servings of high fat dairy, there was a 25% reduction in cardiovascular disease and death just wow. from doing that. What about fat like bacon fat or lard? No, no, no. No, no. When, when you, when you, oh, not so much lard, but when you're looking about processed meats, the evidence there is showing significant problems. So if you had bacon every day or bacon ham or whatever you want to call it, uh, Devon salami, on a daily basis at a reasonable amount, the, the studies have shown about a 40% increased risk for cardiovascular disease doing that. So I'm not... You see, again, it depends on who the red meat's hanging around with. It depends on who the dairy's hanging around with. That's the key to me. And if, if, it's, if it's hanging around with somebody who's carrying too much weight and eating all of other rubbish, that's where it becomes an issue. Here's another question. You, what, what if you weren't overeating calories, but the composition of that was mostly processed food and it had lots of sugar in it? Like, say I was eating lots of donuts. Yeah, no, I, I still don't think that's good for you. Studies like donuts, for example have a significant amount of what we call trans fats in them. And trans fats, they're the really bad fats that really have been shown to be associated. It's not saturated with fat, it's trans fats. Trans fats, that's yeah. what really worries me. And trans, trans fats are in all those like baked foods and baked processed foods, yeah. stuff. Absolutely. Okay. So, yep. so then is it trans fats or sugar or both? I think, it's, I, think it's all, I think it's all of the above. I think it's the preservatives, the additives, all of yeah. those things. We don't know what they're doing to us. Yeah. And, and also- if something's in a container, often that container is plastic and the BPA and all the other stuff leaches into the food. So a lot of these people are sucking on drink bottles, the water bottles. They show there's 500 abnormal chemicals in the water that you're drinking. Mm. So it's it's the container is bad as well. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So we should just stick to the basics, go back to what our grandparents used to eat. Absolutely. <laughs> so before we wrap up today's episode, we're going to finish with our member question of the week, which is from John. And it sounds like it's one for me, but it's actually one for Gina. I've just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I'm struggling with my weight, and I, I know I need to change my lifestyle. Diet's not great. I'm eating fast foods most days of the week and having three to five beers most evening. I know I need to change my habits, and I'm feeling motivated to make the changes to be around my kids. But Dr. Gina, how, how can I start breaking these bad habits and start creating new ones? Oh, John, thank you so much for your question. I love that you said that you're motivated because that is the first step, you know, to, to making any sort of change is that you have to be ready and willing to make the change. And you sound like you've got an awesome reason there is you want to be around for your children. And that's going to be a hugely motivating thing. 
With changing any of our unwanted habits, you want to start really small and then gradually increase it. So at the moment, you're saying that you're eating fast foods most days of the week and you're having three to five beers most evenings. I would start by cutting down, say, one day. So I would have one less day of fast food and one less beer a day, for example, or one less day that you're drinking alcohol. And do that until that starts to feel like it's a natural part of your life and then you would gradually increase it to maybe two days or three days. So that's how, you, like, that's how you're taking away some of your unwanted habits. In terms of creating some new ones, have some really clear goals. What is it that you want to achieve? Is it, for example, like exercising more? Does that mean you could be taking the kids to the park and running around after them or taking them for a bike ride together or doing something that you know is going to fit your lifestyle. It's not going to be too far out from what your life is already like now. Otherwise, it's not going to be sustainable. And then the same with breaking habits and starting small, you want to do the same thing with creating your new ones. Just start really small, pick one day a week or even one day a fortnight to start off with and make sure that you're checking it off on something like a habit tracker so that you can stay accountable and stay accountable to yourself, to your habit tracker and to maybe your partner or to a coach or your doctor or someone else who can really help you along the journey. But we all have unwanted habits, so don't feel disheartened. And, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So it's really just about taking that first step, being really proud of yourself for it, and then building on that as time goes on. Well, that's a great answer, Gina. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode on Eat, Live and Move with Miyagi, where we've debunked the most common myths around cholesterol. We hope you now have a much better understanding of how to manage your heart health. Whatever platform you're listening to today, please hit subscribe so you don't miss out when we drop a new episode. That's all from us. Thanks again and see you next week for more conversations with me, Dr. Ross Walker, and my co-host, Dr. Gina. Bye.